Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Chris Holmes, and this is Burned by Books. On today's show, I'll be welcoming Rachel Krantz, writer, journalist, podcaster, and author of one of the most honest and transparent memoirs about non-monogamy that we have to date. Rachel is one of the founding editors of Bustle, where she served as a senior features editor for three years. She is a recipient of the Peabody Award, the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights International Radio Award, and the Investigative Reporters and Editors Radio Award. Rachel's bravery in putting her desires and her self-conception under the microscope is matched only by the empathy that she offers intimates and strangers. Her voice is original and compelling, and along the way she engages thinkers as varied as sex workers and Buddhist monks. On sex, she writes explicitly and vulnerably, refusing expectations of shame or embarrassment, and the result is a memoir that is exquisitely personal, but with a warmth and hospitality that makes the reader feel at home in Rachel's life. In our conversation, she is thoughtful and contemplative, something that she brings to her own new podcast, Help Existing, in which she invites on guests to get practical help on a specific aspect of, well, existing. I know you'll love Open, and I hope you'll enjoy my conversation with Rachel Krantz. Welcome back. The orgy comes early on in Rachel Krantz's intimate and thought-provoking memoir, Open, an uncensored memoir of love, liberation, and non-monogamy. Rachel attends a Brooklyn-area orgy with her partner, Adam, and from this moment on in the memoir, it is clear that no subject in Rachel's personal life will be taboo. And this is, in fact, a story about breaking cultural taboos around sex and sexuality, especially as it concerns the gendered limitations opposed on women and non-binary people. But Open is also a personal journey story one of exploration and adventure, and a quest for love, sexual love, romantic love, and love for oneself. But despite its subject matter, this isn't a book written to titillate. Rather, what is laid bare is as much the emotional and mental struggles to find true independence as a human being as it is a frank story of sexual encounters. Rachel's journey to understand her desires, which take many forms in the memoir, is supported by a unique array of scholars and experts on gender and sexuality, some of whom are woven into the body of the story while others appear in footnotes. But the certainty of the scholarly rhetoric doesn't match what for Rachel feels sometimes perilous or deeply uncertain about her own life and choices. Open is riveting for the opening from the opening pages, but not necessarily for the reasons you might think. It is beautifully and carefully written. It invites the reader in without pretending to be a guide or a self-help book. And it provides a number of wonderful ways in which readers of all kinds can seek out openness in their lives. I started the memoir thinking... I knew what to expect, and I finished so surprised by Rachel's inquisitiveness, her bravery, and the beauty of her craft. It is a real pleasure to welcome you to the show, Rachel Krantz. Oh, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. Well, I'm so happy you're here. I I just found this to be an incredibly brave memoir, although perhaps brave is the wrong term because you you make it very clear that your desire is to shrug off conventions um, that might bring about shame or embarrassment for things that are so natural and human to our um, to our very existence. And I, I want to start by by taking a run at the title of your memoir, 
open signifies in so many different ways in the story of your awakening. You become open in your relationships, throwing off monogamy for polyamory. You open yourself to the possibility of new sexual identities. You learn to be open to your needs and desires. But also, and rather importantly for this interview, you decided to open up about the most personal details of your love and sex life. Would you talk a little bit about your title and how it resonates for you? Sure. You know, I guess not surprisingly, when you talk about kind of eschewing labels um, that I wasn't really sure what the book should be called for a while. It was kind of one of the last steps and I had a long list of different ideas, but many of them were a play on the word open phrases with the word open in them. For example, one I liked was an open mind Mm. and that that would kind of signify how it's a dual journey between, yes, me opening my mind to non-monogamy and to my desires at the same time as it's also the story of me getting increasingly embedded in an emotionally abusive gaslit relationship where I, my, my mind is quite permeable and eventually kind of gets overtaken by someone else's beliefs and thoughts. And so how it's a parallel journey telling the story of that. So I, I liked that, but my editor publisher was kind of like, you know, just keep it simple. <laughs> How about open? And and certainly I think there was something to that of that's that's kind of all you need to say. And and once you have that lens, yes, it, it works on multiple levels and um, is one of the words that certainly appears most throughout the book. What scared you about putting these intimate details about your sex life into the public domain? And did the writing help you to understand the journey that you were taking? I think I was afraid of what I've been taught to be afraid of. It was kind of a um, exaggeration of rape culture and the fears embedded in that. So I thought, oh, there's no way I can admit to all this without ending up with a stalker or something Mm -hmm, like I, mm -hmm. I think my biggest fears were around like my physical safety of what, you know, what if basically I have so many trolls that I have to change my name or something like that, which was, I think, fantastical uh, thinking. But also when I was an editor at Bustle, I did witness one of my colleagues get doxxed and uh, so harassed that she did have to change her address and legal name. So I knew these are real possibilities. Oh my um, goodness. That's, in, yeah. that's insane. And I knew also from my time at Bustle that people get quite angry when you're a woman writing about sex, um, but particularly when you write about gray areas and leave lots of room for subtlety and kind of refuse to assign clear blame or, or labels of victim and villain, that that can also make people quite upset. So I guess I was afraid of of criticism from all ends, you know, from the kind of Twitter court of public opinion and also from, you know, men's rights activists. And I think in reality, um, those fears were actually pretty overblown, which speaks to my degree of privilege as a cis white woman. Probably I've incurred a lot less harassment than I would have if I um, had been someone of a more marginalized identity writing this book. But I also think that, you know, possibly the level of harassment is uh, correlates with like, how many copies are you selling? And it's just it has to be for people to, to really care. Maybe it has to be like, a huge, huge, huge bestseller um, for you to reach the men's right action, men's rights activists. On you haven't done enough scale. TikToks, Rachel. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and and I certainly have gotten some of that harassment um, to the point where I had to take down my contact form just because it was oh, no, too I'm easy sorry. for those people. But um, by and large, like it's just been love, and I have my DMs open on Twitter and Instagram, and I've just been so heartened by the loving, kind, open reactions have just so far outweighed the negativity that, um, yeah, hopefully that gives some courage to people listening who might be writers fearing what's going to happen to them, that some of that is 
um, internalized and also just perhaps an overestimation of how much people in mass media or culture actually care about books hmm. um, <laughs> and <laughs> that you can you could probably admit to more than you think um, yeah but that said I have a lot of privileges like not um, being able to lose my children because I don't have any uh, you know kind of having made a career where I'm able to be open about these things. We'll see how it works out for me long term. But people I depict in the book, even who live in very liberal cities, are not out as non-monogamous, almost all of them, because you can legally lose your job or your children um, in certain cases for being out as non-monogamous. So these are very taboo, Mm. uh, real stigmas that exist at the same time. I did not know that. That's uh, fascinating and and quite scary. I think definitions are really important, but one of the key aspects of your story is your allergy to being put in boxes. You consider a range of identities contemplating your potential bisexuality, your interest in intimate relationships with women. You consider marriage and exclusivity with your primary partner, Adam. How should a reader of Open understand both your search for a defined sexual identity and your recognition that such categories are inevitably limiting? Mm. Well, I think it's really a a journey where you hopefully see how I come to those conclusions of, of mostly skewing those labels. I think I have found some strength in labels, um, in the time since of kind of owning the term bisexuality or polyamorous, um, especially once I, I learned, uh, more kind of wide definitions of bisexuality is something that is inclusive of all genders and is very much about, uh, Jen Winston writes in her book, Greedy, about bisexuality that, well, for her, it's about finding stability in a state of flux. And I really I really like the idea of bisexuality, contrary to the way the word sounds as something very binary, is actually about eschewing many of those binaries and existing in this sort of in-between place where you refuse to choose. And of course, non-monogamy and polyamory is also an extension of that, of its kind of against mononormative um, culture, which would say you need to choose one gender, one person, um, one identity. But I do think that part of my hesitance um, towards labels or really what I was searching for was not a label, but some idea of an authentic self, (laughs) which is, you know, very typical of writers, human beings, people in their 20s in general, I think. Um, And I think there's the gradual realization as you see me begin to enter my 30s. And and certainly that's what I've found so far of a sort of letting go of that idea that there is um, a true, solid um, self to be found, but rather recognition that it is quite fluid. um, And and sort of, I think the story is really about me uh, coming to these sort of non-dualistic conclusions, these sort of realizations of of impermanence and sort of perhaps beginning to loosen my grasp on the idea that I'm going to, by finding the one or the ones or, uh, you know, having this sexually liberated moment that I'm going to stumble upon some true self. Mm. The uh, the one term maybe alongside bisexuality that you seem to find most flexible and and fluid and and to be the most comfortable with is polyamory. Could you define that for listeners who might not be familiar with the term? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with it now, but it's funny in the in the time that I'm talking about in the book where I was most struggling with jealousy, even the word polyamory was almost, you know, triggering and like a dirty word to me of like, oh, those people who think there's, you know, so much better than me and never experienced jealousy Mm -hmm. and, and kind of the way that I think maybe a lot of people who don't have experience with non-monogamy might feel when they hear the word polyamorous of uh, those those know-it-alls or, or something like that. But but now where I'm at, I, I do feel more comfortable with the word, which means, you know, basically a, a practice or belief in the possibility of more than one love at once. Um, and 
polyamory falls under the umbrella of non-monogamy, um, but is distinct in that while non-monogamy can include things like swinging or um, couples that only have casual sex together or apart, but kind of say it can't be anything with feelings or love, uh, polyamorous really say, no, this is about having multiple loving emotional relationships. That's very helpful. One of the things I really like about your narrative voice in the book is how uncertain it is a lot of the time. We're not entering into the story of an enlightened polyam who is passing down the tablets to the new converts. In fact, there's a wonderful tension between your uncertainty, often even in the middle of the act itself, and the certainty of many of the academics and thinkers on sex, gender, and feminism that enter into your story. Were you searching for certainty in the books you were reading for inspiration? And was it difficult to continue to feel uncertain, even as you encountered others who seemed very certain? Mm. I think I was not so much searching for certainty as I was searching for um, communion or echoes of my experience or or almost clues on the trail, you know, bread, breadcrumbs left by other writers suggesting, okay, turn this way or, or yes, you're on the right path. And I do find I'm often drawn to specifically women's voices, people who, who do sometimes write in very certain terms, even if I kind of eschew that myself and I'm rather suspicious of it at the same time. So people like, you know, Bell Hooks or Rachel Cusk or Audre Lorde, who, who all kind of sometimes make very declarative statements where you're like, do they fully believe this or is this meant to provoke my, my thinking, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I like in their certainty trying on these different beliefs, but I find myself personally, you know, um, returning to one quote I like from Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, where he says, you know, when someone criticizes you, you should say you are partially right. And when someone praises you, you should say you are partially right. <laughs> and I think that's true also when, you know, I find myself thinking that when I read someone who seems very certain in what they're writing or saying, and it's something that I maybe can try on agreeing with in the moment, I'm like, you're partially right. You know, mm -hmm. I think everyone is partially, uh, partially right, partially wrong, maybe to varying degrees. But um, I myself am more careful than ever about being certain in my writing about anything as the intractable or permanent truth, simply because I've been humbled so often by, uh, you know, in earlier years thinking my life was going to turn out a certain way or that I would, you know, for sure want children. And now I'm more unsure of that than ever, you know, as it gets to be more the reality of I'd actually be the age where I need to make that decision and, and things like that, where I just feel like the older you get, the more you realize how much you, you have no idea where your life is going to take you necessarily. Well, I think that idea of uh, being humbled and having a humbleness in writing is something that a lot of academics and scholars and those who write with that in incredible sense of certainty and in these didactic terms could really take to heart sometimes, although it is fun to be provoked by great thinkers in these absolute mm -hmm. terms. But I really did like that sort of back and forth between your own less certain and and emergent thinking, because it's one of the things about the book is it really is a process of you emerging as a person out of the over the arc of the narrative, that younger um, self and those events that are so important um, show up later in the ways that you're able to claim things about yourself. And so that tension between those um, earlier earlier years and earlier events and the way in which you're able to find things about yourself in a new kind of flexible thinking about a full human and a full experience, yeah. I really think is one of the great qualities of the memoir. Um, Thank you. A big question that remained for me even as I, even after finishing the memoir, is what a person striving for true openness does with the problem of other people's desires. There's this 
idea that literature gives us the inside of the other. We are allowed to see inside other people's minds. And it's a wonderful magic trick of literature that unfortunately we're very bad at as real people. And so we are always in conflict in some way or another in the fact that we don't know other people's absolute desires. In your process for understanding your own desire and how it shapes and is constricted by gendered expectations, leads you to seek sex and relationships that don't require that typical power differential. But Adam, for example, clearly wants both openness and commitment. Open the memoir is about recognizing and defending your own desires, but even with deep self-reflection, aren't we always having to negotiate with others' desires, which are likely in some way to limit our own? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that you hear from Kathy Labriola, who's um, my counselor throughout the book and also a, a writer about polyamory, polyamorous relationship coach that she says it's a, you know, it's a delusion to think that you could ever be in a long-term relationship and not have to give up any freedoms. Um, I mean, you you might still be able to hold on to certain freedoms, especially in a non-monogamous relationship, but that to say, oh, you know, because we're open or because everyone's responsible for their own feelings, I'm just going to do whatever I want and you have to deal with with it and it's it's your choice how to deal with it um i think you see me grappling throughout the narrative with adam very much does take that stance of like your emotions are your responsibility um and anything i do if you are reacting negatively to that is because of your social conditioning or things you need to work on in yourself and I think you see how that ideology of openness, I guess, um, or non-attachment can be really wielded as a form of uh, control, ironically. And you see me grappling with that because I know in that ideology is uh, something true, but that it's being wielded against me in a way that does not feel right. And I'm trying to make myself feel right. Um, but, you know, there are kernels of truth in many of the uh, ideas that people sometimes use to control or oppress others. And and in that case, the, the kernel of truth was that, yeah, like when an emotion is yours, it is at the end of the day, your responsibility or we shouldn't always examine or we shouldn't always consider our initial um, reactions or feelings to be the the truth with a capital T um, just because that's our initial reaction. But, you know, the distinction that uh, Tashi, the Buddhist monk I, I meet and have a discussion about this with towards the end of the book helps me make as he says, you know, yes, when an emotion is yours, it's your responsibility. But if someone else is misbehaving and blaming it on, you know, your emotions, then you're basically enabling their confusion. You're enabling bad behavior on their part. So yes, you are responsible for your emotions, but if someone is mistreating you, uh, you know, that basically means it's on you to take yourself out of that situation. That, that doesn't mean you should just become uh, a sort of vessel for other people's beliefs or that you should uh, passively take whatever is thrown your way, injustice or mistreatment. On the contrary, that's an attitude of, you know, because I take responsibility for myself, I am not going to be mistreated. One of the terrible ironies of uh, the abuse that you receive from Adam is that it is on the back of that ideology of openness, a sort of perverse version of it. But it must have been terrible to have to, on the one hand, be seeking to open yourself up in all these different ways, and then to have a partner who purportedly cared for your best interest tell you, Basically, you're just doing it wrong um, and your feelings are therefore wrong and must be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was very difficult. It was very confusing because 
you know, it was my first non-monogamous relationship. It was also my first uh, dom-sub relationship, except that it was an unhealthy one in that he didn't acknowledge it as such. So he he kind of actively looked down upon uh, the kink community and uh, contractual relationships. And yet that was very much the dynamic we were in. So I was navigating, you know, all these things, playing with power, playing with non-monogamy, coming into my queerness. So it was very difficult when someone was telling me, this is just your societal conditioning talking right now Mm -hmm. that's making you paranoid. I'm not actually mistreating you or I didn't actually say that or this didn't actually even happen. You know, it was very it was very confusing because it was already a situation where the ground uh, was moving beneath my feet and where things felt more um, malleable than ever. And I wanted to continue on that journey because it was bearing so much fruit. And yet I was also feeling increasingly anxious and miserable because I was being um, mistreated along that journey. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, kinks and, and kinks shaming and another important tension in in open is between your own sort of unlearning of kink shaming and the bias against non-normative desires and the pervasiveness of again of violence and abuse against women and trans people how does one learn to understand the lines between pain as a form of pleasure and our culture's fetish for abusing and harming cis and trans women? And is it a different thing for a, a cis man to be in a, quote, open relationship? Hmm. Uh, well, I'll take the last part of that question first. I think it it perhaps is a different thing, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> um, I think that ideally... It would it would be the same, meaning that, you know, um, men would have just the same permission to explore a wide range of emotions and sexualities that is often granted to women in liberal spaces, um, swinger spaces, for example, that I depict in the book where basically all the women are assumed to be um, at least hetero flexible, but, but none of the men play with other men. And I know that that's beginning to change, but by and large, that's still a massive double standard. And you certainly see you know, Adam throughout the book as a sort of representation of traditional patriarchy. He's very dominant. He's very sure of himself. He's hyper rational. He's always in control. We see how he suffers under that patriarchy, perhaps less or in different ways than I suffer as the sort of, um, you know, <laughs> underlord of that system or whatever, but he's still suffering. There's still a lot of repression and shame that then is being acted out on me and other other women because of that disavowed vulnerability and shame. So I think that I was very curious about exploring the psychology of that and exploring the ways in which um, men in our culture, yes, have certain Uh, advantages or however you want to put it, but are also really, really restricted in ways that I'm not throughout the story. And I don't, I don't know that a a cis man in our culture could write a book like I wrote without being potentially torn apart. Um, And I think that's unfair. So I ideally that there would be a culture where everyone feels safe from violence, everyone feels free to be equally open and vulnerable and respect one another's feelings. But I guess if there is any sort of difference between men and women in open relationships, it would just be like anything acknowledging pre-existing power dynamics and systems at play is really important the same way as if you're a white person in relationship with someone who's black, you need to examine and acknowledge the um, pre-existing power dynamics that might be implicit within that, these systems that are always going to permeate, even if you want to think yourself outside them. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of the kink part of the question, it was really important to me to explore within the book that line between what is kink and what is abuse, because I think it's a very um, common experience to, as one is navigating these things, become confused. And I've heard from a lot of 
women, especially since who also came to non-monogamy or also came to kink through relationships that ended up being um, abusive. And it's even a kind of trope in um, like kind of daddy dom romance novels of sort of that the the woman is recovering from from a you know her first experience with being dominated was with this sort of bad dom who's sort of a very much atom figure who abuses that power and i think that exists as a trope because it's a it's a common experience you know if you're drawn to someone who is very very dominant that is sometimes going to be people who abuse that power however consensual bdsm is another thing entirely and uh people who practice kink in a conscientious way are some of the some of the most thoughtful people and potentially some of the most thoughtful men as well because they're actually making explicit and thinking about what consent is what what power dynamics mean how do you actively ensure that you continue to have someone's consent throughout so I think, you know, you see me really grappling with this. You see the pitfalls of where I'm confused. And then with the footnotes and the experts contextualizing, you hopefully see the real difference of sort of learning from my mistakes. How might you practice kink in a way that doesn't veer into these less healthy behaviors? What What is the difference? What are some of the conversations you need to have? And if you're in a situation where you're not sure what's going on, you know, even supplying readers with hotlines of, of numbers they can call and other resources to help them untangle that. This brings me to Miranda, who's such an interesting figure in your memoir. She works as a dominatrix and is a primary figure in your sexual awakening. She comes off in your narrative as an ethical and caring person. Um, Are there limits for you in the kind of humiliation and pain that should be inflicted on someone else, even if it is their desire and they give at least uh, explicit consent? Right. Um, well, it's funny you when you meet Miranda, she's grappling with with just this of she's feeling conflicted about being paid to shit into a guy's mouth. I don't know if I can say that on you, the podcast. You definitely can, and, and it is the, it is precisely the moment I was thinking of. <laughs> Yeah. And she's like, you know, it's such easy money. It's what he wants. Um, But she's really like, I don't know that that's a healthy thing to want for her. It feels too far. And I know that in the end, she did decide against uh, doing that and has had times where she's grappled with no longer wanting to work with um, people who want uh, to be under lock and key and wear literal chastity belts because she's felt not that that act itself is wrong, but that sometimes these extreme requests are being um, used not just as a way to process trauma, but as a substitute for other ways of processing trauma. So for her, you know, when we meet her, she's been working as a dominatrix for years, but she's also in graduate school to become a social worker. Mm -hmm. And you really see how those things are not at all in conflict. And, And her sort of guiding ethic is one of a sort of Hippocratic oath of like, do no harm, you know, perhaps counterintuitively, but harm in the larger sense of if I'm going to be, you know, flogging someone that I want to feel this is ultimately like serving their um, fulfillment and, and mental health. But if she feels in getting to know a client that it's crossed over into, um, a way of perhaps compartmentalizing, dealing with important trauma or childhood trauma and is kind of, yeah, to the detriment of their overall schema of mental health, then she's going to pull back. So it's a sort of holistic view. And I guess I, I agree with that. You know, I think that it's about, do you, it's sometimes certainly the kindest thing to, um, to, allow someone to explore their own submissiveness or even masochism, but it's up to you as a person with the power in that situation to really be finely attuned with and talking about these things with them when you're not in a scene um, or where you're in negotiation so that you have a sense of, is this serving them or is this potentially hurting them? So 
yeah, it's a it's a fine line to walk. I mean, you 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 put it in terms, and and I spe- I think especially when you're writing about Miranda, that 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 feels like it it can have this kind of ethical, thoughtful, reflectiveness. It's also a big burden for the dominatrix if uh, she needs to be essentially a. a a therapist or a psychoanalyst to be able to determine what can be consented to. It it sounds like Miranda's up to the job, but are, are are you worried at all that she's probably not the, the standard or the average? I don't know. I mean, I think that a lot of people who are sex workers or dominatrix are doing some form of therapeutic work. And a lot of the people I've met doing that work are more attuned to than your average person to human psychology and that's part of their interest in it um i think certainly there's there's ways that you could be a dominatrix and not be plugged into that at all but you're probably not a very good one because so much of dominance is psychological um so to to be really successful at it you have to be attuned psychologically but yeah i think a lot of people do end up um quitting eventually because it is too much uh, psychological burden or, you know, it's kind of a common thing to hear about the the sissies or, or the male subs being incredibly needy and, and texting you at all hours of the day and, you know, and being like, oh, I want to serve you, but really it's a, it's a form of a demand. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think it depends on the person, but by and large, a lot of these people come to it because they, they are interested in these things or maybe even have a tendency to be healers. Throughout Open, you use theories of liberation to understand your own journey. Can you explain how the idea of liberation guides you? I think um, when I was living the story in the book, I was looking at liberation mostly as something that would come to me again, like I said, once I reached some sort of romantic sexual moment of enlightenment or um, sureness about my authentic true self, or maybe a sureness that Adam or someone else was my person and that I would continue on this very unconventional path with with them. Um, And I think that now my definition of liberation is, is something much more expansive. And while it includes questions of sexual and romantic liberation. It's it's much more about um, how can I increasingly be comfortable in the present moment rather than living in the future and constantly striving or grasping after the next thing? Um, how can I continue dissolving my sense of um, a solid, separate, self or permanent self, um, a self that's not interconnected and instead increasingly see myself as um, my liberation being dependent on others' liberation and, and not in an abstract way, but really in a in a felt, lived way. Um, I think I also see liberation as increasingly in that letting go of self, um, having less attachment to my own body um, and to my own fear of of that body aging or dying. So I guess I I see, yeah, liberation now as something where I'm I'm able to continually like widen my concept of self, view interconnectedness, accept impermanence, um, and just kind of have less attachment to the idea that there's ever going to be a place I reach where I feel like, ah, now I've arrived um, at the meaning of my life or at my true self or at my soulmate or at, you know, my fullest creative potential or whatever this external goal may be, but rather a sort of um, happiness or serenity that ideally is less and less reliant on externals. That's a wonderful um 
explication of something like Buddhism, and certainly mm -hmm. you're influenced by Buddhist thinkers. And I, I wonder if uh, the idea of you know, religion in a non-institutional way, does that continue to be really important to understanding openness for you? It does. And again, in a way that what I appreciate about Buddhism is that the Buddha himself said, like, you know, don't take anything I'm saying as the <laughs> truth, you know, take it and apply for yourself. If it serves you, great. If not, leave it behind and really emphasizes that you can become attached too attached to any ideology or um, concept, even if it's a wholesome one. So you could become attached to the concept of, of non-attachment, for example, and you see that happening throughout the book with me and Adam. Um, so yeah, again, I take that attitude of finding it very useful as a lens. It's the one that I've most consistently found when I test it or apply it, that it can, keeps feeling true. So I keep wanting to explore and deepen my study. But you know, not all of it and 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 what doesn't serve or feel right, I, I take that advice and, and leave it behind and, and certainly look to many other thinkers, spiritually, religiously, academically, um, for their ideas and just and and I'm really curious about the wisdom everyone has from many different perspectives and and I find it um, applicable in different ways at different periods, again, in a way that's always going to be fluid. And this is the intellectual side of the openness of your title, how much you want to con consistently avail yourself to new ideas and new thinkers. It's a very appealing aspect of that that side of openness that you, that you give us. Before I, I let you go, I'd love to know if there were particular memoirs that guided you during your writing process, and also just any books that you'd like to recommend on this topic or any others that you're just loving right now. Oh my gosh, how much time do you have? I have so many. <laughs> I figured you'd have a few. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think really the book is, you know, all these other books I draw and I viewed them as the Greek chorus, sort of. Um, you see these echoes of the things I'm experiencing in these other books I've read or these other thinkers' ideas and lives. Um, and so I think one thing I've heard from readers that I love is that it's given them a whole list of all these other books they need to read, like that there's so many ideas for further reading within the book itself. But some that were really on my mind as I was writing it were um, two, I suppose, craft books, Craft in the Real World by Matthew Celesis and, and then The Heroine's Journey um, by Maureen Murdoch. And Craft in the Real World talks a lot about... Um, you know, examining in fiction specifically, but in writing in general and how we structure our stories, how we're reinforcing um, potentially white supremacy culture, patriarchy, dominant Western narratives, um, and how can we sort of like undermine that in a practical way in our craft, in the way we talk about craft, but also in our writing itself, which was important to me. Um, and The Heroine's Journey, is a book that sort of looks at, you know, Joseph Campbell's typical hero's journey and then applies a very feminine lens to it, looking more at the sort of internal journey that many um, women, but people in general, might go on in terms of going through these phases where they, they disavow the, the feminine at the beginning of the journey um, and kind of go on this internal odyssey and exploration and eventually end up in a place where they have hopefully internalized the masculine and the feminine within. And so I was sort of using that roadmap as a way of um, thinking about the journey I had been on and also just sort of reaffirming that it really was its own odyssey that I was on and, and thinking about how interesting that was to try to have it be this kind of hero's journey where it's not about a war or literal monsters, but rather my own quest for um, romantic and sexual liberation. Um, I also really loved the memoir Empty I read as I was writing the book. That's by Susan Burton. And she just wrote about her eating disorder in a way that I found really raw 
and inspiring in, in the extent of what she was willing to admit to, um, and also the extent to which she wasn't claiming to be all better now mm-hmm. or have it all figured out. And I think a lot of memoirs that might be of recovery or, or difficult traumatic experiences, there's really that pressure to like end up in a place where like now you're all better or um, now you, you've you overcome these things. And, and so I found a lot of inspiration in that. And then finally, Are You My Mother by Alison Bechtel um, is a really important graphic memoir that I find myself coming back to for her examination of her own psychology, her familial relationships, and also the way she weaves in um, context of uh, psychology and research that she's done that I I found that to be very um, instructive along with Communion by, by Bell Hooks where she also, although she's talking more in terms of theory and sort of making feminist arguments, she is willing to draw on her personal life for an example and context in a vulnerable way that I I continue to find very inspiring. These are great recommendations, and I will absolutely make sure they are up on our website at burnedbybooks.com. Rachel, thank you so much uh, for your book and for this wonderful conversation. I so appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for these thoughtful questions. Well, that's all from me for now. My great thanks to Rachel Krantz. Her recommendations will be on the website at burnedbybooks.com. There you'll find links to our previous episodes and many recommended books available at independent bookstores everywhere. My next episode is a very special one. For my 50th episode anniversary, I'll be talking with Alice Elliott Dark, author of Fellowship Point, a novel that many of my guests are calling one of the best books of the 21st century so far. I hope you'll tune in and help me celebrate. Until then, this has been Burned by Books.